Order. Before we come to the statement by the Home Secretary, I need to inform the House that because of charges have now been brought in the Sarah Everhart case, legal proceedings are now active for the purposes of the House of Judicy resolution. That means that reference should not be made to the case, including any details of those against whom charges have been brought. It is, however, in order to discuss, for example, the relationship between the COVID-19 regulations and the right to protest. I now call the Home Secretary. Priti Patel. Yeah. With permission, Mr Speaker, I would like to make a statement on the tragic death of Sarah Everard and the events of Saturday evening. I would like to begin by saying that my thoughts and prayers are with Sarah's family and friends at this unbearable time. And I know that every member of this House will join me in offering her loved ones our deepest sympathies. While this is a horrific case, which has rightly prompted debate and questions around wider issues, we must remember that a young woman has lost her life and that a family is grieving. Mr Speaker, let me turn to this weekend's events. I have already said that some of the footage circulating online of Clapham Common is upsetting. So whilst the police are rightly operationally independent, I asked the Metropolitan Police for a report into what had happened. This government backs our police in fighting crime and keeping the public safe. But in the interests of providing greater assurance and ensuring public confidence, I have asked Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary to conduct a full independent lessons learned review. The Metropolitan Police Commissioner has welcomed this, and I will await the report and, of course, update the House in due course. Mr Speaker, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge why Sarah's death has upset so many. My heartache and that of others can be summed up in just five words. She was just walking home. And while the specific circumstances of Sarah's disappearance are thankfully uncommon, what has happened has reminded women everywhere of the steps that we take each day without a second thought to keep ourselves safe. It has rightly ignited anger at the danger posed to women by predatory men, an anger I feel as strongly as anyone. And accounts shared online in the wake of Sarah's disappearance are so powerful because every single one of us can relate to them. Too many of us have walked home from school or work alone, only to hear footsteps uncomfortably close behind us. Too many of us have pretended to be on the phone to a friend to scare someone off. Too many of us have clutched our keys in our fists in case we need to defend ourselves. And that is not OK. Women and girls must feel safe whilst walking our streets. That is why we have continued to take action. Our landmark domestic abuse bill is on track to receive royal assent by the end of April, and this will transform our collective response to this abhorrent crime. This builds on other measures we have brought forward, including the controlling or coercive behaviour offence and the domestic violence disclosure scheme, known as Clare's Law, which enables individuals to ask the police whether their partner has a violent or abusive past. We have also introduced new preventative tools and powers to tackle crimes including stalking, female genital mutilation and so-called upskirting. But we can never be complacent, which is why throughout the passage of the Domestic Abuse Bill, we have accepted amendments from honourable members from political parties across this House. The bill now includes new offences of non-fatal strangulation, outlaws threats to disclose intimate images, and extends the controlling or co coercive behaviour offence to cover post-separation abuse. This is in addition to the bill's existing measures, which include a new statutory definition of domestic abuse that recognises the many forms abuse can take. That's psychological, physical, emotional, economic, sexual, and of course the impact of abuse on children, as well as the new rules to prevent victims having to go through the pain of being cross-examined by their abusers in family and in civil courts. We all know action is needed to improve the outcomes for rape cases, and we are currently developing robust actions as part of our end-to-end -end review of rape 
to reverse the decline in outcomes in recent years. And Mr Speaker, at the end of last year in December, I launched the first ever public survey of women and girls to hear their views on how we can better tackle these gendered crimes. On Friday, in the wake of the outpouring of grief, I reopened that survey. I can tell the House that as of 11am today, the Home Office has received 78,000 responses since 6pm on Friday. That is completely unprecedented and considerably more than the 18,000 responses received over the entire 10-week period when the survey was previously open. I am listening to women and girls up and down the country and their views will help to shape a new strategy on tackling violence against women and girls, which I will bring forward to this House later this year. The Police, Crime, Sentencing and Courts Bill, which we will, Mr Speaker, shortly be debating, will end the halfway release of those convicted for sexual offences such as rape. Instead, under our law, vile criminals responsible for these terrible crimes will spend at least two-thirds of their time behind bars. Our new law will extend the scope of the Sexual Offences Act 2003 with regards to the abuse of positions of trust, something which predominantly affects young girls. And it will introduce Kay's Law, which will encourage the police to impose pre-charge bail with appropriate conditions where necessary and proportionate to do so, which we hope will, will provide reassurance and additional protection for alleged victims in high-harm cases like domestic abuse. I note the opposition will today be voting against these crucial measures, against measures to support victims of violent crimes, including young women and girls. Finally, Mr Speaker, the Government is providing an extra £40 million to help victims during the pandemic and beyond. And last month, we launched a new Government advertising campaign, hashtag It Still Matters, to raise awareness of sexual violence services and ensure victims know where to get help. Mr Speaker, I want to end by saying that over the past year, during the coronavirus pandemic, the police have been faced with an, an enviable and immediately difficult task. It is one, for the most part, that they have approached with skill and professionalism, helping to enforce regulations as determined by Parliament with one crucial objective in mind, to save lives. This House approved those changes by 524 votes to 16 on the 6th of January this year. Sadly, as of Sunday the 14th of March, more than 125,500 lives have been lost to this horrible virus. It is for that reason that I continue to urge everyone, for as long as these regulations are in place, not to participate in large gatherings or attend protests. The right to protest is the cornerstone of our democracy but the Government's duty remains to prevent more lives being lost during this pandemic. Finally, Mr Speaker, there will undoubtedly be more discussions of these vitally important issues in the days and weeks to come. But we cannot forget and must not forget that a family is grieving. And I know the thoughts and prayers of this whole House are with Sarah's loved ones at this truly terrible time. We now come to Shadow Home Secretary Nick Thomason. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Home Secretary for coming to the House today to make a statement for advance sight of it. We come together at a time of national grief and what must now be a time of change. The news of Sarah Everard's death is heartbreaking for us all, and our thoughts are with her family and friends. And whilst I of course appreciate the legal sensitivity of the case, reports around its circumstances are extremely distressing. The reaction to Sarah Everard's death across the country has been extraordinarily powerful and moving, led by the passionate voices of women and girls who are rightly demanding action and change. And it cannot be right that so many women continue to fear for their safety on a daily basis, whether on the streets or at home. The testimonies that have been shared highlight the unacceptable levels of abuse and misogyny Harassment on the streets, walking home with headphones turned off to listen for threats, keys between fingers, being told to stay home after dark to avoid attackers. But let me be clear, it is not women 
who should change their behaviour. It is men and wider society that needs to change. And at times like this, it is vital people are able to have their voices heard, of course in a way that is lawful and COVID secure. Yet this weekend in Clapham, things clearly went very wrong. And I share the anger about the policing and the scenes we saw. It's right that the Mayor of London has shown leadership by calling on Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary and the Independent Office for Police Conduct to investigate. The Home Secretary asked for a report from the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, and I hope she will publish it because transparency is so important. Can the Home Secretary also publish the minutes of the advance meeting that were held on Friday, mentioned by the Policing Minister on the media this morning? And can she confirm what communication she personally had with the Metropolitan Police prior to the events on Saturday? And whilst the event was a vigil, not a protest, the scenes from Clapham should be a red warning light to the government that ministers should not be rushing through laws, cracking down on protest. The truth is, Mr Speaker, this government is failing to address violence against women and girls and ministers even want to curtail their right to protest about it. It is a chronic failure from this government. And meetings and reopening surveys alone are nowhere near enough. And meetings we understand that the Women and Equalities Minister won't even be attending this evening. Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that recorded rapes doubled between 2014 and 2019, doubled. The Crime Survey for England and Wales showed that over two million people experienced domestic abuse in a year, yet only a tiny fraction are charged, and charging rates are falling. The justice system sends a perverse message that murdering someone at home, which predominantly means men killing women, is a lesser crime than killing someone in the street by handing out shorter sentences for domestic homicides. The 296-page bill we will consider later today contains the word memorial eight times and fails to include the word women once. The government's message is they want to lock up people who damage the statues of slave traders for 10 years when rape sentences start at half that. And I say to the government today, unless this changes, unless there's action on homicide, unless there's action on street harassment, unless there's action on stalking, this bill will risk becoming an abuser's charter that just allows violence and injustice in our streets and in our homes to continue unchecked. Ministers have been on the airwaves today, struggling to find aspects of the bill that will make a difference to addressing violence against women and girls. And let me just take one example. Ministers have pointed to whole life tariffs for rape. Now, I would ask the Home Secretary, when she gets to her feet, to answer how many rape convictions have resulted in life terms. Because the answer is hardly any. Today, the High Court ruled in favour of the status quo on rape. And it is a status quo that is shameful, and the government must change. The figures show that 99%, 99% of rapes reported to the police in England and Wales result in no legal proceedings whatsoever. 99%. It's effectively a get-out-of-jail-free card, and it is appalling. It doesn't have to be this way. This could be a time of national unity when we decide to come together as a country to put forward protections. The government can either change course, take necessary action, or ministers will find themselves on the wrong side of history once again. Yeah. Secretary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I'd like to thank the Honourable Gentleman for his comments, but if I may, Mr Speaker, at a time when the country is mourning a, in significant, a significant loss, and there, there are moments of great unity. I'm quite sorry to hear the tone of the Honourable Gentleman, particularly in terms of the government's record when it comes to and our commitment of tackling violence against women and girls. And the Right Honourable Gentleman will also be well cited, more than aware, of the significant contributions of all members of this House to the Domestic Abuse Bill, 
which has been under debate, scrutiny, challenge, amendment for a considerable period of time, in fact. And it is in the House of Lords, the other place right now. But I would like to emphasise, Mr Speaker, that this government is committed when it comes to violence against women and girls at the highest level. And when you look at, in fact, the work of this government over the last decade, and if I may, Mr Speaker, I'd like to pay tribute to my right honourable friend, the member for Maidenhead, for all her work in particular, because she was the one that really set the bar high in legislation um, from all the measures, not just in terms of the DA bill, but FGM, violence against women and girls, um, everything that has been put forward in terms of money, support for charities, this government is building upon that, and no one can ignore that simple fact. The Right Honourable Gentleman has also made some specific references to the bill that will be debated this afternoon, um, in particular as well to rape and rape convictions. The bill is a criminal, um, criminal justice bill, as well as a policing bill, and he will also be very mindful of the work that this government is undertaking right now with regard to the end-to-end -end rape review to completely reverse the declining outcomes that we have seen in recent years. This government is increasingly and very honest up front about the declining outcomes that we have seen. We are working with all the relevant parties, including the CPS. We want to change the way of direction there. And there is much more work to come, and that will be published in due course, shortly in fact. But to say that the bill itself does nothing for women is completely wrong primarily when it comes to sentencing, because it will end the halfway release of those convicted for sexual offences such as rape. Instead, our laws will go after those vile criminals, and they will spend at least two-thirds of their times behind bars. And, Mr Speaker, I think it's worth reflecting that it was in 2003, under a Labour government, that made automatic halfway release mandatory for all standard determinant sentences, regardless of whether the offender had been convicted of a violent or sexual offence. And the bill of discussion that will be debated later on will reverse that policy. The Honourable Gentleman, the Right Honourable Gentleman, also says that there is no mention of women in the bill, specifically. That is another accusation that I will reject, primarily because it is a criminal law and sentencing bill which applies equally to everybody. And the party opposite will also know that in line with the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act Bill in 2005, the Criminal Justice Act in 2003, neither of those bills which related to criminal justice and sentencing mentioned women as well. Now, of course, there are many other measures that we will discuss through the passage later on of this bill. But I do, Mr Speaker, want to come back to the statement, the points that I have made in particular. Um, it is right when it comes to um, the Metropolitan Police. Um, I have had many discussions with them on Friday, over the weekend, with the Commissioner specifically, um, in relation to preparations and planning prior to Saturday evening. Um, my comments are public, they're on the record in terms of what has happened, and quite frankly, the upsetting images that were um, out on Saturday evening. We have a review that's now being conducted by Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Contemporary. It is right that takes place. I also think, Mr Speaker, no one should prejudge anything in terms of you know, conduct um, until we absolutely see what has happened in terms of that report. The police are rightly operationally independent. But I do just want to conclude by saying that, of course, all of us in this House, this isn't just about the government, all of us want to work to drive the right outcome so that women feel safe. Laws and legislation will absolutely do that. There's no question about that. But there is something also about behaviour and culture. That's culture across society. That's culture with men as well. And we should be upfront about that, never shy away from being honest and discussing that. But right now, I think this House should all have in their thoughts and in their prayer Sarah's families and friends at this particularly unbearable time. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank my right honourable friend for her remarks. And she is right to remind us that behind the events of Saturday lies the tragic death of Sarah Everard, a bright young woman dearly loved by her family and friends. And I join my right honourable friend and other members of this House in saying that my thoughts and prayers are with Sarah's family and friends at this time. We want justice for Sarah. We also want women to be able to feel and be safe on our streets and in their homes. So does my right honourable friend agree that we must redouble our efforts 
to make sure that the government's excellent domestic abuse bill reaches the statute book as anticipated next month, but also recognise that legislation is not enough and that if we are going to eradicate violence against women and girls, we need a change of attitudes. And that is about dealing with perpetrators, changing their behaviour, but also teaching young men and boys about respect for women and about what is or is not acceptable in a relationship. Yeah. Well, I would just like to very much pay tribute to my right honourable friend for her comments. And her work and leadership, no question um, around domestic abuse, but violence against women and girls. And she is absolutely right in terms of the fact that the domestic abuse bill is a landmark bill. It is a landmark piece of legislation that I think actually all honourable members of this House should feel proud of in the work that has come together across, across this House. Um, but also, my right honourable friend is absolutely right in terms of the cultural and behavioural aspects that must be changed. And, you know, for all, all of us um, have to be conscious of that. You know, as, as a mother bringing up a young son, um, absolutely respecting women and girls and treating everyone fairly and rightly with equality and understanding that there, there are no barriers and demonstrating that respect to one another and importantly, tolerance to one another as well is absolutely vital. There is so much more work to do. Legislation can only go so far. We can never, ever be complacent. But with that as well, as a government, and I think this parliament, this house, across both houses, will absolutely share the determination and the desire to do so much more when it comes to protecting girls and women, but also in our strategies where we must all be united. This isn't about just saying, you know, um, there's a survey taking place. We must all contribute to that. And in fact, now the survey has been reopened, I very much hope that members of the party opposite will actually contribute to that to help us have a united and coherent approach, one voice approach, in fact, to how we can support and prevent, um, support women and girls, but prevent violence against women and girls too. Let's go to SNP spokesperson Angela Crawley. Angela. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The murder of Sarah Everard has truly shocked and saddened us all. Can I join the other, others in sending our heartfelt condolences to Sarah's family and friends at this time? She was walking home, a sentence that resonates with all women. This tragedy serves as a stark reminder to women who assess every aspect of their daily lives in fear of sexual violence, assault, or abhorrent crimes inflicted at the hands of men. Can I once more take this opportunity to urge the PM to ratify the Istanbul Convention without further delay? Across the UK this weekend, women reclaimed the streets in protest and to pay tribute to the life of Sarah Everard. Police responding have received widespread criticism and the questions must be answered as to whether the actions were necessary and proportionate to protect and prevent public harm. The public health crisis has made restrictions necessary and the public gatherings unadvisable. So while the police face difficult decisions every day, it's impossible to watch the footage of the events at Clapham Commons without shock and concern that the policing appeared heavy-handed and disproportionate. Therefore, it is right that the Chief Inspector of the Constabulary has been asked to conduct a review. In Scotland, this incident would have been examined by the Independent Advisory Group, experts with a specific remit to ensure the use of powers is consistent with human rights principles and legislation. Turning to the police sentencing and court bill, the right of protest must remain a fundamental human right. Can I therefore ask the Secretary of State to confirm that the remit of the Chief Inspector's review will focus on human rights as well as policing matters? I thank the Honourable Lady for her remarks and also her sentiment um, on the tragic death of Sarah Everard. Um, I think there are a number of points um, that I, if I may, just come back on to. I mean, the Honourable Lady is absolutely right in terms of the role of the Inspectorate, um, and we will wait for that review, and obviously I will report back. And I think it's worth just reflecting, Mr Speaker, once again, that this has been a difficult and demanding period for the police. Um, the impact of coronavirus restrictions, and we know why they are in place as well. And on the point of protest, Mr Speaker, I, I'm very, very conscious that we will have the debate later on this afternoon as well. 
This government absolutely supports um, the, assembly, the freedom of expression and clearly when it comes to the whole issue of the right to protest, that's fundamental to our democratic freedoms. Without wanting to prejudge the debate or prejudge the further um, discussions on the bill, um, the legislation um, will, of course, speak about the police using um, powers um, in terms of how they would manage protests. But it's also worth reflecting that this will be updating legislation, um, the Public Order Act of 1986, which was enacted over, over 30 years ago. And so this will be very much part of the discussion that we will be having in due course. Let's go to Deanna Davison. Deanna. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I join my right honourable friend and voices right across the house in paying my deepest condolences to Sarah Everard's family and loved ones. It's a truly heartbreaking situation that I know has allowed many women to find the strength to share their own experiences. And I was really moved to hear that 78,000 people have now responded to the reopened consultation, and I'm encouraging many others to, to do the same and share their voice. But does my right honourable friend agree with me that if we really want to get the best outcome and make our streets feel safer for everyone, that we have to listen to all voices, both men and women, people of all political persuasions, to ensure that we're truly working together to deliver the change that we need. Well, I thank my honourable friend for her, her comments and her questions, actually, as well. She's, of course, absolutely right. And, you know, this is a collective effort for everyone to be part of shaping future strategy, shaping future policy and legislation. And we can do that together, which is why, Mr Speaker, it is quite unprecedented and incredible that 78,000 people have responded to the survey. That is something we are, we are really pleased about because we do want to encourage people to contribute. And I would also encourage, as you've already heard me say, Mr Speaker, all members of this House to play their role and actually join that contribution. To the Select Committee of Thank you, Mr Speaker, can I join with the expressions from across the House of deep sympathy and condolences to Sarah Everard's family. Following her tragic death, women across the country have been moved to talk about the experiences that we all share and that no one should have to endure, of feeling threatened and unsafe on our own streets. Eight months ago, I put forward measures to uh, deal with repeat perpetrators of abuse and stalking to be able to register them, to be able to prevent the problem where they move from one victim to another, no one keeps track and they get away with it. At that time, ministers said those measures weren't needed. Has she looked at this again and will she work with me and Baroness Royal and Paladin to make sure we can bring in these strong measures and take action against repeat perpetrators and keep more women Safe. The Right Honourable Lady is absolutely right about the points that she has been raising and the measures um, at large. There is something about perpetrators and their serial offending that has to be addressed. There is no question about that at all. And of course, this does link pre predominantly to many of the criminal justice outcomes and the wider debate that this House will be having, not just later on today, but, I, but over future weeks as well. I will be very candid, we will look at all measures, and rightly so. We should be doing everything possible to keep women safe, but actually keeping everyone safe. And the behaviour of serial perpetrators, serial offenders, is deeply corrosive, deeply damaging, and obviously with just dreadful, dreadful implications and consequences. So we'd be very happy to continue, not just to look at these measures, but I think it's fair to say right now, obviously with the violence against women and girls consultation that is underway, we will continue to engage with others and follow up on these points. Let's go to Philip Davis. Philip Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's clearly unacceptable for any woman to feel unsafe walking the streets. Can I propose some practical measures that the Home Secretary might adopt. Can she introduce a fund for, to roll out much more CCTV around the country, which will help to make our streets safer for people and bring evidence where there's a crime committed? Can she stop taking people off the DNA database? There are huge numbers of crimes, sexual assaults, rapes and murders, where there's DNA evidence available, but no match. Uh, and the more people on the DNA database, the more chance of getting these people uh, off our streets and rightly convicted. Can we increase the sentences for people convicted of sexual assaults and rapes? And can we stop the early release, the automatic early release 
of criminals who still are considered a threat to society. These measures would actually help make our streets safer for everyone. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, and I thank my honourable friend for his, his comments and his practical suggestions. We are doing a lot on CCTV and we do have the Safer Streets Fund, which my honourable friend will be very, very aware of. And of course, he's raised a number of areas which I suspect if he were to join the Bill Committee of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, he could absolutely contribute to and make those points there. Ribeiro Abbey. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'm join members in continuing to extend our thoughts and prayers to Sarah Everard's family. My constituents have reacted with justified anger to the Metropolitan Police's treatment of those in attendance at this weekend's vigil to commemorate Sarah and all women who lost their lives to gender-based violence. It's bitterly ironic that an event intended to highlight the issue of public safety for women was blocked on the grounds of public safety. What happened this weekend is a reminder of what happens when police try to completely bypass the views of the communities they serve. So does the Home Secretary recognise that the police's high-handed approach got the balance between public safety and the right to protest completely wrong? Does the Home Secretary agree that the police's heavy-handed treatment of female protesters was wrong? And will the Home Secretary now accept her policing crime and sentencing and courts bill is ill-conceived? My constituents are very angry about what, was, what has happened and want to know what the government will do to reassure them that they will proactively address violence against women and girls and deep-seated forms of institutional discrimination in the UK police. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, well, I understand the sentiment that the Honourable Lady is raising on behalf of her constituents and obviously recognise the constituency that she represents and the terrible, um, tragic events that have happened and taken place. Um, all our thoughts are clearly with Sarah Everard and her family. And of course, the vigil that was planned, um, the police themselves, the Metropolitan Police, had been involved and spent a great deal of time um, with the organisers and the Metropolitan Police have been very public about that. I'm not going to repeat my comments about um, seeking greater assurance and ensuring public confidence in policing, hence the reason why Her Majesty's Inspectorate are now conducting a full independent lessons learned review. I think that is absolutely appropriate. My comments about Saturday evening are on the record and well known. With regards to the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which the Honourable Lady has referred to, that is a manifesto bill that this government was elected on, and we will, of course, participate in second reading later on this afternoon. It is not ill-conceived at all. The British public voted for it. We live in a democracy, and this government will work to deliver on that. Let's go to Pauline Latham. Pauline. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the announced in-depth review into the criminal justice system when it comes to rape and sexual assault? Does my right and friend agree that every part of the criminal justice system has to play its role in bringing perpetrators to justice and better supporting victims? There's a lot of rape happens within marriage, and it's not the best situation when people have been married under the age of 18 to a man who is much older. So could my right honourable friend also look at that to see how we can stop that sort of situation arising? My friend is absolutely right, and I just would like to pay tribute to her for her work and campaigning um, on this particular issue. Um, and of course, she's absolutely right that this is about the criminal justice system from an end to end perspective. So, from policing right through not just to um, charging, but actually conviction as well. And that is effectively what the police bill is about, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, which is why it goes across two departments. But the rape review itself is fundamentally important because obviously the numbers have not been going in the right direction. We have to understand the lessons as to why charging decisions have been, you know, how they are. Also the impact on witnesses and victims themselves, victims and the attrition that takes place when it comes to them even going to court. So there is a lot of work that's taking place in this area. I should also just mention in dispatches the Prime Minister leads the Crime and Justice Task Force where this is one of those fundamental issues, again across government, not just Home Office but across the MOJ where we are bringing these core elements together with the DPP, looking, working with the CPS, working with the AG. These issues are absolutely integral to the entire system. Let's go to Ed Davey. 
Ed Davey. Can I send my condolences and thoughts to the family and friends of Sarah Everard at this most difficult of times? Mr. Speaker, the scenes of women being forced to the ground, restrained and arrested simply for holding a peaceful vigil in memory of Sarah Everard and in condemnation of violence against women and girls were utterly disgraceful. Of course, the Met Commissioner Cressida Dick must resign, but can I ask the Home Secretary what personal responsibility she herself has for the terrible handling of this peaceful vigil? Did the Home Secretary speak to the Met Commissioner in the run-up to the vigil? If so, will she tell the House now what guidance and advice she gave the Met Police in advance of the vigil? Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Honourable Gentleman is right in the sense that those scenes were distressing and upsetting. There is no question about that at all. And I've already spoken about the measures that are now in place in terms of getting assurance on, in the way in which the Metropolitan Police um, conducted, obviously, their operations. They are rightly operationally independent. And there is obviously now the lessons learned, independent review taking place. I had been in touch with the Metropolitan Police Commissioner on Friday and throughout the weekend, and we have had extensive discussions in terms of planning, preparation for the vigil at the weekend. I should, however, Mr Speaker, emphasise that on Friday there was legal action underway. So until that legal action had been determined, um, and of course the Metropolitan Police um, the Commissioner and the Met Police themselves were engaging with the organisers of the visual. Um, there, there were various plans that the police were working on. I will be very clear, though, on Friday, my views were known, and they were based on the fact that um, people who wanted to pay tribute, obviously within the locality, bear in mind we are in a pandemic, we cannot forget that, we are in a health pandemic, that people who live locally, clearly who, who, who were either out you know, on a daily basis, passing through, laying flowers is absolutely the right thing to do, and we saw many people doing that. But of course, as I've said, those scenes on Saturday evening were upsetting. That is the reason why I asked for the Metropolitan Police Commissioner to provide a report on the event itself, what happened, and now why we have a lessons learned review into the operational um, effect and impact in terms of what happened. Let's go to Stephen Hammond. Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like colleagues across the House, my condolences are with Sarah Everard's family and friends. All women should feel safe and no offender should think they can abuse women on the streets or anywhere else. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that all reports of allegations of abuse must be seriously and more rigorously investigated and that there must be confidence in the justice system that it will do this and that it will support victims? Could she confirm that the violence against women and girls consultation strategy, she intends that there will be that confidence in the justice system after the consultation? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. Um, much of what we are discussing right now, Mr Speaker, speaks to greater assurance and public confidence in the criminal justice system. And of course, members have touched on already as well in policing um, and the events on Saturday evening. It is absolutely, it's vitally important that through the um, VOR consultation, the development of the strategy, we look at this not in an isolated way. This has to be end-to-end -end in terms of the entire system. So right down to the types of abuse and harassment that girls and women are experiencing, understanding the root causes and the behavioural factors as to why perpetrators and individuals are behaving in a particular way, why abuse is taking place, right down to how we as a country and as a government tackle um, those issues as well. So that does impinge upon the criminal justice system and of course all our work is based on driving better outcomes but the right outcomes and where criminality takes place and ensuring that the perpetrators of crimes are receiving the tough sentences that they deserve. Let's go to Caroline Lucas. Caroline. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join others in extending my condolences to Sarah Everard's family. 
and to the family of Biba Henry, Nicole Smallman, and countless others who have lost their lives because of male violence. Now, I acknowledge the particular policing challenges at a time of COVID restrictions, but the Met is still obliged to follow the Human Rights Act and execute its powers proportionately and only when necessary. And it's clear to everyone that they got it terribly wrong on Saturday night. Does she therefore not see that handing over yet more draconian powers to the police when they have so badly misjudged this situation would be both foolish and dangerous? And that a bill which criminalizes protests which are noisy and have impact effectively means canceling this country's long-standing right to peaceful protest altogether? And finally, will she stand in solidarity with women arrested over the weekend and call for the withdrawal of any fixed penalty notices that were issued because of the Met's disproportionate response? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I won't go over my comments about um, the police on Saturday evening. I think those points have been made. Um, I absolutely, if I may, um, disagree, and we will discuss this at a later stage, obviously, through the um, through the police bill later on this afternoon. But the fact of the matter is. As a country, we absolutely believe in freedom of expression and the rights of people, free speech, and for individuals to express themselves freely through protest as well, manage protests in the right way. And the police always engage with individuals and organisers. We will debate this during the course of the bill, Mr Speaker, but I'm afraid I think the Honourable Lady has completely misrepresented the proposals that we are putting forward. Shireen Duncan Smith. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the murder of Sarah Arad is, uh, was a shocking event, and I feel terribly sorry for the family that they've gone through, made even edgier, really, by the fact that there's now been charges levelled against a police officer. We require police officers to protect everybody, particularly and women as well. However, I received a note from a police... Or, 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 can I just remind the gentleman, we shouldn't be talking about the suspect at this stage. Uh, my apologies, Mr. Speaker. I wasn't going to refer to him. I've been just in passing. Uh, the reality, though, that the right my right honourable friend has announced that she is having an inquiry into what happened in those terrible events on Saturday night, and they were shameful. But it ill behoves politicians to get up, pass judgment on what happened without all the evidence. I was contacted by a female police officer today to tell me of what happened to her on that night. She was threatened. She was told that she should have been murdered, not Sarah Everard, uh, and that she was manhandled. I simply say, on all sides, we should be dialing this down, not trying to raise the temperature by calling for resignations, etc. Well, can I just thank my right honourable friend for his remarks, his comment, and the point that he makes. And it's a well made point, if I may say so. I, too, Mr. Speaker, have been written to by many police officers expressing very similar sentiments as well from their own experiences and I think the point about not prejudging is absolutely right. Um, the police have operational independence obviously as Home Secretary I have called for a report I've received a report but there is now an independent review and it's right that we have that review yes for assurance purposes but also to strengthen public confidence in policing and obviously for all members of this house as well to in due course hear the full facts as to what happened. Let's go to Liz Savile-Roberts. Liz. Joachim Vaolivares, and I would like to take this opportunity to extend my personal fat sympathy for the family and friends of Sarah Everard at this horrific time. In June 2020, I proposed a domestic abuse register for the early identification of abusive men as a means of preventing death and injury. The Minister for Safeguarding Guarding rejected this, claiming that current systems for preventing violence, violence against women were adequate. The National Police Chiefs Council also objected on the grounds of costs and their capacity to manage such a register. I sense that the government now recognises that the current system is failing women and that a properly funded, staffed and supported register for serial stalkers and domestic violence perpetrators is urgently needed. How will the Home Secretary make sure that such new proposals and funding properly account for the different legislative landscape in Wales, so that women in Wales aren't excluded from future protections, which I hope are on their way. Home Secretary. Well, Mr Speaker, I think this is an important, important moment, actually, for this House and for all colleagues when it comes to domestic abuse bill measures, which have been extensively debated in this House. It is vital, of course, and the Right Honourable Lady has clearly spoken about Wales and the authority and the responsibilities there. We are 
absolutely working across the devolved administrations because we want consistency in the approach. It's right that we all work together to support women. And the Domestic Abuse Bill will do that, absolutely do that. And my honourable friend, the Safeguarding Minister, has worked extensively with all colleagues in the House um, on the issue that the honourable lady has raised. Um, but the fact of the matter is we want this bill to receive royal assent. It should do very soon. We need it to happen to safeguard more and more women and give the protection that they desperately need from their, from their abusers. Chris Loder. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. I went to Clapham Common Bandstand yesterday evening to pay my own respects, uh, and I, uh, like members from across this House, uh, send my greatest sympathies and sadnesses to Sarah's family. Mr Speaker, I believe that it is highly regrettable that members of the Opposition demand that the first female Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police resign in this situation. May I ask my right hon. Friend, what is she doing to ensure that the facts are understood properly before premature conclusions are made on people's actions? Thank you. Well, I, I thank oh, my honourable friend for his question and also for the sentiment that he has shared with the House this afternoon. I agree entirely with his comments. And alongside that, of course, he has asked, what, will I, will I, what am I doing? By commissioning the Inspectorate of Constabulary, it is important that we have the full facts in addition to supplement the lessons learned review. And I, I come back to the point, Mr Speaker, I would really strongly recommend that colleagues do not prejudge. The images were upsetting, of course they were upsetting, but alongside that, it is right that we see the full report in due course and we hear the facts as they come out. We are now come to Ian Paisley. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. C can I too add my voice uh, and condolences to the family of uh, Ms Everard and her family and friends and all those who have been affected by this most hellish and tragic uh, uh, murders. Turning to the events that we saw in Clapham Common on Saturday evening, Mr Speaker, members I think are entitled to ask the question, however, what on earth were the Metropolitan Police thinking? What on earth happened to police discretion? What on earth happened to proportionality, to flexibility, to empathy, to any sense of self-awareness, given the circumstances that surrounded that hellish murder. Every ingredient of good policing, in my view and in the views of many of my constituents, appeared to be completely absent from the policing activity on Clapham Common. The defining image that will stick in the collective mind of Britain will be Patsy Stevenson being almost sat upon by three police officers whilst being detained. I must say, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I saw one of my adult daughters treated that way, I would find it impossible to contain my anger in terms of what happened. Can I ask the Home Secretary, therefore, how quickly will this report be made available? How expeditiously can the Home Secretary act to rectify what is an appalling wrong? Um, Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Honourable Gentleman's comments are very strong, but in response to his question, he knows, the House knows, I've um, uh, commissioned now the Const um, Inspectorate of Constabulary for the report. I have asked for the report to conclude in the next fortnight, um, which we will then obviously then update the House in terms of findings and recommendations. I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's worth just reflecting, though, in terms of what happened on Saturday. For approximately eight hours, there was peace um, around the bandstand. People were respectfully, well, paying their respects, um, laying flowers, grieving, showing support and empathy in a way in which you know, every individual would, would want to in terms of offering their sympathies and condolences. That is why we need to look at the review to see effectively what happened operationally. And then, of course, if lessons need to be learned, they will be post the report. Sarah Dye. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I offer also my condolences to the friends and family of Sarah Everard? 
Does my right honourable friend agree with me that it's frankly absurd to hear this afternoon that the party opposite is actually opposing the provisions of the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill that wants to increase sentences for rapists? There's a dichotomy there which is a bit absurd, is it not? Secretary. Well, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and to be very frank, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I was quite surprised when I did hear that was the position that the party opposite would take in place. This is a criminal justice bill. It will increase sentences for individuals, perpetrators that perpetrate the most horrendous, appalling sexual offences and crimes against women, children, citizens. And of course, it is an important bill, as I've said already, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's key to our manifesto. The British public voted for it. This government and our party in government as well are absolutely determined to strengthen our laws and the criminal justice system so that we can pull away those individuals that cause harm to individuals um, and increase sentences. Uh, we now go to Diane Abbott. Our thoughts and prayers are with Sarah Everard family. And the Home Secretary will be aware that the whole nation was upset by the images of women who had come to a peaceful vigil about violence to women and who found themselves wrestled to the ground and handcuffed by police officers. Is the Home Secretary aware that the Metropolitan Police's statement, which sought to justify what happened on Saturday by talking about, and I quote, the overriding need to protect people's safety, but issue where some people are puzzled at the idea that you can make people safe by manhandling them and handcuffing them. In relation to the policing bill, which the House will be debating later. She herself has made it clear that this bill is expressly designed to crack down on peaceful protests by groups like Extinction Rebellion and Black Lives Matter. She described Black Lives Matter peaceful process as dreadful. Can she understand why many people in this country believe that giving the police even more powers to crack down on peaceful protests can only lead to more scenes like the distressing scenes that the nation witnessed on Saturday at the vigil on Clapham Common. Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, with respect um, to the Right Honourable Lady, um, with, with regards, first of all, to the events on Saturday evening, um, I would urge the Honourable Lady not to be so judgmental until we actually see the report that comes from the Inspector of Constabulary. Um, the Honourable Lady, Right Honourable Lady, will have plenty of opportunity to discuss um, protest and police powers through the passage of the bill. But I would just like to say this. In recent years, we have seen a significant change in protest tactics, which have led to disruption which have also led to violence and people's lives being endangered. So I look forward to the debates with the Honourable Lady on this particular point later on, but she's absolutely wrong in her characterisation of the measures that we are introducing. Uh, before I call the next speaker, could I um, just say that I'm very keen to make sure we get everybody um, in, in, in this important statement. So um, if I could ask colleagues to be fairly brief with their questions and obviously the answers as well. Sir Graham Brady. I'll try my best, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Home Secretary has uh, rightly said that the right to protest is a cornerstone of our democracy. But as she also said, this House on the 6th of January voted swinging powers to control uh, protests for the period of the coronavirus restrictions. Can I ask her to work with concerned members across the House to make sure that the legislation that we're about to pass protects that right of peaceful protest uh, and only stops serious disruption. Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right, and I thank him um, for his question. Um, I will continue to always engage with colleagues, all colleagues, on this. It's a really important point. 
and I know how hard it has been for many colleagues in this house, um, looking at the regulations, the implications of those regulations, um, and the restrictions that they have brought in. And of course, this, this would also be subject to, bit, to debate in the House going forward. Harriet Harman. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, and I would like to pay my deepest sympathy in respects to the family of Sarah Everard and her many dismayed and grieving friends. Um, I, welcoming the re I welcome the reopening of the Violence Against Women and Girls Statement uh, survey consultation. Um, it's evident that the Home Secretary recognises the genuine and justified strength of feeling about women's safety that lay behind the vigil on Clapham Common. So surely it was just wrong of the Metropolitan Commissioner to refuse to reach agreement with the organisers to find a way so the vigil could go ahead, but to do so safely. Does she agree with the Joint Committee on Human Rights that the law on protest during this COVID pandemic needs clarifying so that protests can go ahead, but do so safely? The Joint Committee on Human Rights has drafted regulations which will be published with our report later this week. Will she undertake to consider them seriously with a view to laying them before the House? Secretary. Well, I thank um, the Right Honourable Lady for her comments. And look, I think everybody across this House, you know, has expressed shock, grief, um, and obviously concern about the images from Saturday evening. Um, no dispute there whatsoever. I will, of course, look at the report when it is published. Um, I'd be more than happy to have discussions with colleagues about the report as well. We are in a pandemic, and this has been a very, very difficult period. It's been difficult for the police as well. I'm the first to acknowledge that. We've asked the police to do unprecedented things. They have unprecedented powers throughout this pandemic based on the need to protect public health. Um, one would hope now that collectively, with the incredible work of the vaccine rollout and you know, as we ensure that that carries on smoothly, as we move through the Prime Minister's roadmap and the plan of easements, that we can work together to absolutely, yes, live with coronavirus, but do things differently. We now go to Faye Jones. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I join colleagues across the House in sending my heartfelt condolences to Sarah Everard's loved ones. I'm shocked at the way in which Saturday night's vigil was policed. The situation demanded sensitivity and compassion, something which was evidently lacking. But I'm also shocked that what started as a peaceful and important vigil turned into a protest with photographs showing ACAB signs, which stands for All Cops Are Bastards. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm concerned that a young woman's murder could be hijacked by those who would seek to defund the police and destabilise our society, making it even harder for women to come forward and report assaults, with the Home Secretary confirmed that nothing will deter the government from delivering stronger legislation to protect women and girls from harm. Home Secretary. My honourable friend is absolutely right, and I thank her for her points that she has made. Um, we will continue absolutely to do everything in terms of our strategies, policies and laws going forward to protect women and to ensure that they are safeguarded in the right way. But at the same time, she's made a very, very important point that a peaceful vigil, vigil on Saturday turned into some pretty ugly scenes. So we'll wait for the report. And there is no question that where there are lessons to be learned, they will be learned. And of course, where individuals were acting inappropriately in the way in which she has said, obviously, that will be subject to some consideration too. We now go to Rosie Duffield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to put on record my thanks to Kent Police for their incredibly difficult work in the ongoing investigation into the tragic death of Sarah Everard. In order to seriously tackle violence against women and girls, it's vital to put women at the heart of legislation. However, in today's policing bill, women are not even mentioned. With that in mind, and with rape convictions being at a shocking all-time low, how will the Home Secretary ensure that women can come forward with confidence that they will be believed and that they will receive justice? Thank Secretary. You. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, if I may, I'd just also like to give my thank to Kent Police 
for all the work that they have been doing in conjunction with the Metropolitan Police in the investigation associated with the um, Sarah Everard case. This has been a very, very difficult time across policing, there's no doubt about that. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm not going to come back in details um, to the points because I have covered many already in my statement. But I speak with conviction in my determination, as does every member of this government, when it comes to safeguarding women and also our strategies and approach to violence against women and girls. And as I've repeatedly said, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would welcome all members to join us in a cross-party effort to do much more to give women and girls the confidence to come forward. Sir Charles Walker. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, this House criminalised the freedom of protest. This House, us. Not Dame Cressida, not the Metropolitan Police. We did. We criminalised the freedom to protest collectively. We are up to our eyeballs in this. Does the Home Secretary, my right honourable friend, agree with me that now is the time to decriminalise freedom of protest? Not tomorrow, not next week, but this afternoon, this evening. Let's get people back on the streets Let's allow people to get things off their chest again. Protest is a safety valve. Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I understand entirely the sentiment that my right honourable friend um, has um, emphasised and echoed this afternoon. Um, the Prime Minister has laid out a roadmap, and I appreciate that the Honourable right honourable gentleman would love me to say right now, let's just do this and change things immediately. There is a roadmap that has been laid out. We are still in a pandemic and we are following with the guidance that has been put in place. And obviously this will be subject to debate over the next week or so. And I'm more than happy to continue to discuss this with my colleagues. Uh, we now go to Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Peaceful assembly must be an absolute right in this country, and the actions of the police on Saturday were deeply troubling. And I'd like to highlight the use of kettling in particular. Many disabled people and disabled people's organisations have long raised concerns about the use of this controversial crowd control tactic, which in the past has been used for up to 10 hours with serious potential health implications. What does the Home Secretary have to say to the many disabled people who fear this disproportionate policy? Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, in response to the Honourable Lady's question around operational tactics, which obviously Kettlin is based upon a situation and a police assessment around a protest or an event that might take place. That is obviously something that the police themselves um, make a decision on and judgments on in terms of the tactics that they use as part of their operations. She's also, though, raised an important point about people with disability, disabled people, um, should they wish to express themselves, part, join protests and participation. And of course, their needs can be met um, through protests and the way in which they express themselves by working with the police um, and many of the organisers that talk to the police around the types of people, the groups um, and the type of characteristics of the individuals that are coming out to protest as well. So this isn't just about you know, a one-size-fits-all approach. She will be well aware as, as to the approach that the police take when it comes to organisations and engaging with organisers over protests. Thank you. We now go to Laura Farris. Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to put on record uh, my sympathies to the family and partner of Sarah Everard. Um, thank, I thank my right honourable friend for her statement. In the last few months, I've been working with Our Streets Now on the issue of public street harassment, vile and explicit language that is aimed at women with the purpose of degrading them, and they are often children, schoolgirls. I look forward to my right honourable friend's strategy later this year, but would she also consider as part of that bringing forward legislation that might address this issue? Well, my friend has raised an important point, and in fact, I've met um, many young girls, schoolgirls, in fact, who are part of that campaign. Um, we will consider all options as part of the VORG strategy. Uh, we now go to Alison Thulis. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. On Sunday, I shed a tear along with so many other women at the gates of Queen's Park, where ribbons and tributes had been left in memory 
of Sarah Everard and for Moira Jones, who was raped and murdered there in 2008, and for all women who've experienced abuse at the hands of men. So can I ask what the Home Secretary is going to do to change the toxic culture that we have, which diminishes and minimises women's experience, and to challenge this whole spectrum of men's behaviour so that my daughter and all young women can grow up without living their lives in fear? Home Secretary. Well, the Honourable Lady um, has an opportunity as well to join us, and she's heard me speak today, Madam Deputy Speaker, as all colleagues have, about the need to contribute to our VORG strategy. This isn't about the work of one individual. This is about what we do collectively together in terms of cultural norms and changing behaviours. We all have a role to play, and I urge her to join us in that effort. We now go to Heather Wheeler. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah, can I thank my right honourable friend for a statement and extend my heartfelt condolences to Sarah Everard's family at this time? Does my right honourable friend agree with me and my South Derbyshire constituents that it is frankly absurd for the party opposite to in the same breath call for tougher sentences against rapists whilst also opposing this bill, which delivers exactly this? Well, my honourable friend has summed it up perfectly and I completely agree with the sentiment that she's just expressed. <laughs> We now go to Tonya Antoniazzi. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week on the Armed Forces Bill Committee, we heard about prosecuting crimes, including rape, through the military courts. One statement stood out for me where it was said, our service people are thoroughly good people, but they drink too much. Something goes wrong and they end up in court. Now, what discussions has her department had around this attitude towards victims of male violence? And does this re reflect a general attitude to women that we saw on Saturday on Clapham Common? Home Secretary. Well, I think, first of all, um, no, it does not reflect a general attitude to women. And no one should um, prejudge or um, just make assumptions of that nature. In terms of, she's made a very important point, though, in terms of the armed forces work and um, the, the work that's taking place across both our departments, in fact. And our Minister for Safeguarding um, has done extensive work on this particular issue with our colleagues in the Ministry of Defence, and of course that will continue. We now go to Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I express my condolences to Sarah Everard's friends and family, and thank the Home Secretary for reopening the VOG consultation and for requesting the Lessons Learned review into Saturday night's policing. She has shown that she is determined there will be action, not just words. 78,000 responses so far is absolutely enormous. These are women who do not have confidence in the system at present, and we desperately need to instill confidence for them. That will take an enormous effort in shifting cultures, in coming together and working collectively to make sure we achieve that aim. But can my right honourable friend assure me that those women are going to have their voices heard in the Justice Task Force which looks suspiciously like an all-male room. Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank my um, right honourable friend for her, her points and obviously the importance and significance of the VORG consultation uh, and the fact that that's been reopened. Um, let me give her assurance that the Crime and Justice Task Force is not a male show at all. Um, both myself, I'm, I, I, I am obviously as part, a part of that as is the safeguarding minister. And there are many other agencies and parties that are involved in that, including the first female Metropolitan Police Commissioner as well. So there are a range of voices. And again, I would urge people from being too judgmental that all the work that takes place in government is just by men, because it is not. Again, just a reminder to colleagues that we do need to be quite um, brief in our questions if we're going to be able to get everybody in, which I do want to do. Um, I'm sure the way will be led by Kim Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'd like to add my thoughts and condolences to the families of Sarah Everard, Biba Henry and Nicole Smallman and all women who have died violently. Does the Home Secretary agree with me that if you're black, disabled or a trans woman, you are disproportionately more likely to be a victim of violence. This is not emphasised in the Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill. And what steps is she taking to rectify this? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Home Secretary. I thank the Honourable Lady. 
we want to prevent anybody, we want to prevent anyone from becoming a victim of crime. And it is not just our conviction determination, but it should be our collective imperative to make sure that no one becomes a victim, and particularly anybody from the groups that she has just referred to. We now go to Maria Miller. Can I also send my deepest sympathy to the family and friends of Sarah Everard and echo comments made uh, with regards to the events of Saturday evening? Because nobody should have to feel threatened when streets uh, when uh, on our streets. The best way to prevent violence against women and girls is to tackle the root causes of that violence. New government research has identified viewing pornography, particularly violent pornography, as an influential factor in harmful sexual behaviour towards women and girls. What will my right honourable friend be doing to reflect that finding in new government policy? Oh, well, my right honourable friend has in fact made a very, very powerful and important point about the behavioural aspects and the links to pornography. And I know it's an issue that she herself has been focused on. I'd very much like to discuss this with her further as part of our work to protect women and girls um, from violence. We now go to Vera Hobhouse. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My heart goes out to Sarah Everard's family and friends during this horrific, horrific time. Madam Deputy Speaker, a year ago, on International Women's Day, I tabled a private member's bill making misogyny a hate crime. In light of the recent horrific events and the continuous failure to prevent women and girls from violence, will the government now commit to adopt my bill to end some of the injustices that continue against women Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Lady will know that the Law Commission is looking at this area, and in fact, their consultation closed in December. So I absolutely will work with the House and report back on this whole area um, and continue to work with the Minister for Safeguarding on this issue. We now go to Suzanne Webb. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am proud of a government who, since 2010, have put women's safety at the heart of their policy making. And does my right honourable friend agree with me that our landmark domestic abuse bill puts women at the front and centre of this government's policy making when it comes to tackling violence against women and girls? Well, my friend is absolutely right, which is why I do pay tribute again to everybody that's worked on this bill. This is a landmark bill and it will lead to the protection of more women and children against domestic violence. So we absolutely want to see this bill receive royal assent. We now go to Catherine West. I'm afraid, Catherine West, we can't hear you at the minute, so I'm going to um, go to Dr. Rupa Huck and we will come back to Catherine West once that's sorted out. Rupa the tragedy that befell Sarah Everard is cue for rethinking so much, including readopting, designing out crime principles into our built environment. So can I ask, as one small Asian woman to another, that in all new housing developments and the reappraisal of the LTN road uh, layout changes due, that consultative consideration of women's safety and fear of crime is mandated so that appropriate natural surveillance is built in and that we avoid creating nouveau ghettos where perceptions leave women trapped and vulnerable. Female. Home Secretary. No, my, my honourable friend makes such an important and interesting point, she really does, about designing out. Um, crime and threats, particularly in public spaces. And there's a lot of work that actually is taking place right now in terms of keeping the public safe in public places. Um, but this is absolutely something that we will look at. Uh, Dr. Luke Evans. Thank you, uh, Deputy uh, Speaker. And uh, I've been contacted by several constituents in Bosworth who are concerned about the events over the weekend. On one hand, some are concerned about the police's contact, uh, conduct. On the other hand, concerned about mass gatherings during a pandemic. So to what assessment has my right honourable rule friend made about the fact that this is an operational issue to the Met versus the fundamental framework of the law? And taking that forward, can she reassure my constituents that with the police, crime, sentencing and courts bill, it will protect the rights of those protesting, 
protect the rights of the police to be safe, but also lay down the responsibility of those protesting uh, not to cause serious disruption and the res uh, responsibility for the police to act proportionately. Thank you. Well, I thank my honourable, my honourable friend for his questions. Um, he is right in some cases, but I, I think, Madam Deputy Speaker, for the interest of time, we'll come back to some of these points when we come and discuss the bill shortly. We now go to Dame Angela Eagle. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. We now live in a country where domestic violence has soared, but prosecutions have plummeted, where rape has been effectively decriminalised because prosecutions are at their lowest ever level, and where stalking a woman gets a shorter sentence than fly-tipping. This is the record of the Home Secretary and her government. Is she proud of it? Madam Secretary, if I may, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'll refer the Honourable Lady to the comments that I made earlier on, including the fact that I disagree with the points that she's just made. Uh, number 38 is withdrawn, so we go to Stella Creasy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. A quarter of all police forces are either already actively recording or trialling recording where crimes are motivated by a hatred of somebody's sex or gender. Where they do this, the police have better intelligence to track and prevent violence against women, and women report more confidence in coming forward to report assaults and harassment. Will the Home Secretary and her government drop their opposition to Amendment 87B to the Domestic Abuse Bill tonight in the House of Lords to require all police forces to follow this best practice in England and Wales and finally put us on the road to equalising misogyny as a hate crime as it should be? Home Secretary. Well, the Honourable Lady will, I think it's fair to say, um, have to follow the debate later on in the laws in the other place, um, because there is extensive debate and discussion on this, as she will well know. We now go to Selene Saxby. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I would also like to add my condolences to the family and friends of Sarah Everard. Does my right honourable friend agree that the Domestic Abuse Bill showcases this government's commitment to protecting and listening to victims of domestic abuse, who are mostly women, so that we can tackle this abhorrent crime effectively, along with the increased funding we have given to organisations such as North Devon Against Domestic Abuse in my constituency, who do so much to support the victims of this dreadful abuse? Home Secretary. No, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and I won't go through the measures that I've um, touched on earlier on, but clearly this domestic abuse bill is a landmark bill and it will absolutely change outcomes on domestic abuse but also increase support to women that have been victims of domestic abuse. We now go to Helen Hayes. Thank you Madam Deputy Speaker. My thoughts are also with the family and friends of Sarah Everard at this desperately sad time. On the same day that the suspect in the Sarah Everard investigation was arrested, UN Women published survey results showing that 97% of women aged 18 to 24 have experienced sexual harassment. While we wait for the, the reviews and investigations into the events of Saturday night, will the Home Secretary work with the Metropolitan Police to mandate that every officer serving undertakes training into misogyny and sexual harassment so that young women living in London can have confidence that their concerns will now be taken seriously and they will receive an appropriate response from the police when reporting this aggression which causes women everywhere to be fearful every day in our streets and public spaces. Your Home Secretary. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I think it's important when it comes to um, police training in particular to just reflect on a lot of the work that is underway already across all police forces and not just the Metropolitan Police Force. College of Policing has extensive work taking place in this area and this is also subject to a lot of the work that takes place at the National Crime Board. Uh, we now go to David Johnston. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I also extend my deepest condolences to Sarah Everard's friends and family. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that preventing violence against women is partly about what we do with boys, and that means teaching them that what's often depicted on TV, online, in video games is not acceptable behaviour, as well as simply restricting what they see through the forthcoming online harms bill? 
Secretary. Well, of course, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and that is another bill that will be coming to the House in due course. But it is about cultural aspects and the behaviours that we inculcate in our children, basically. Um, you know, how our boys grow up and the things that they themselves are exposed to. This will be subject to much discussion. Um, and again, we very much welcome the views of him and others um, for the consultation that we've just reopened. We now go to Dawn Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and my deepest condolences to Sarah Everard's loved one and all those who have lost loved ones to violence, and to Bibba Henry and Nicole Smallman loved ones who have been really struggling recently. Sir Patrick Vallance said that it is clear in the Sage Papers that outdoors is a much lower risk than indoors, and it is difficult to see how outdoor events can cause a spike. So public health was not really the primary driving factor. But even if we do accept that some of the restrictions were needed to safeguard public health, as a parliament, as a defender of free speech, we need to be careful about restricting the rights of people to express their views. Saturday showed us the mess of not allowing people to organize properly and what happens when the police are confused about their powers. The general public did not vote to have their democracy removed and their voice silenced. Can I just ask the Home Secretary, who is she consulting with when suggesting additional draconian police powers? Secretary. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm going to refer the Honourable Lady to comments that I've made extensively this afternoon about COVID restrictions, but also the fact when it came to the events on Saturday, the vigil, there had been extensive dialogue that had taken place between the Metropolitan Police and the organisers. James Gray. Ms. 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 Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Home Secretary will agree with me. I know there are very many serious questions to be answered about the policing of the vigil in Clapham Common on Saturday evening. Would you not also agree with me that it's quite wrong to conflate that with the perfectly reasonable provisions in the bill which we debated in late this afternoon, which will prevent disruptive protests of all kinds, prevent people coming into Parliament, prevent ambulances getting on their way, prevent ordinary people going about their everyday business? That's a completely different matter, and the two should not be conflated. That's absolutely right, and I thank my honourable friend for his point and his comments, because there is conveniently far too much conflation taking place when it comes to examples of protests. This will be subject to debate later on today through the passage of the bill, but my honourable friend is absolutely correct on that. We now go to Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, much of the debate over the last few days has focused on how we secure women's safety in the public domain. Does the Home Secretary agree with me that it's equally important that government policy secures women's safety in private settings, including women's refuges, and does the, women's, does the Home Secretary agree with me that government should prioritise upholding single-sex spaces, services, provision and roles for women and girls where single-sex provision is permitted under the Equality Act? Secretary. Well, my, the Right Honourable Lady makes important points, obviously, about violence that takes place at home and also the need to safeguard women. This is exactly what this government has been doing, particularly over the last now soon to be 12 months under coronavirus and this pandemic through the money that we've been putting in place, refuges, providing support, but also just giving awareness and places where people can go to to demonstrate or express or let the police know as well that they have been a victim of abuse. This work will continue. It is so important. And I should just finally conclude, Madam Deputy Speaker, by saying that as we almost unlock through the roadmap on coronavirus, we should be prepared for more people to actually raise some unpleasant experiences that they themselves have had and they will be supported through policing and obviously by this government. Uh, for our final question, we are just going back to Catherine West. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Homicide rates amongst women have shot up under this government. The impact of Sarah Everard's murder is devastating in Hornsey and Wood Green, where hundreds of women, men, teenagers from all corners of my constituency have written in to express their grief and anger. What urgent action will the Home Secretary take to convince us that they take violence against women and girls seriously? Until there's a credible response, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm putting the Home Secretary on notice that women in Hornsey and Wood Green will not be patronised and silenced. 
Home Secretary. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, no one should be patronised or silenced, which is why we have reopened the VOR consultation and 78,000 people have responded since 6pm on Friday evening. I would urge others to come forward as well. Perhaps the Honourable Lady would like to and also encourage her constituents to do so. There is much more work that we can do collectively to drive better outcomes to stop violence against women and girls. Uh, I thank the Home Secretary for her, her statement. We will have a short, probably two-minute um, uh, suspension to allow for necessary arrangements for the next business.